Today in this video, we're gonna explore the three levels of reverb from beginner to pro to expert. My hope and goal for this video is that you come away feeling more confident and intentional whenever you pull up and use this special tool. We'll start with beginner level reverb by jumping into one of my very first GarageBand sessions that I converted to a Logic session. All right, I've got this old hard drive that I've put some of my old projects on, old Logic from GarageBand and Tammy's running song. Oh man, let's open this up, let's see what the date is. January 31st, 2011. This should be a real good representation of how a beginner uses reverb. Let's see if uh, this song is worth running to. I don't know how I was <laughs> sort of managing volume, so I'm gonna save our ears here and just like bring down the volume. Let's bring it down to like 10 and I'll just kind of ride this fader to protect our ears. Yeah, I'm glad I turned the volume down because I can tell we're going to quickly lose all our headroom. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, right away, it's just sounds like I'm sending everything to the same space. <laughs> Cracking the whip of Zeus. I actually dig that chord progression. That's kind of a cool bass line. Okay. Oh shoot, oh wow, sorry. Blasting your ears there, okay. <laughs> That's funny, it's so interesting. I haven't heard that for so long and I totally remember creating this. So let's go ahead and open up the mixer window. Now, Logic's converting this looks like they're creating some sends here. Beginners don't really create sends because you don't really know what like buses and auxiliary channels are. So I wasn't doing that for sure. Logic is just doing this to convert it. It looks like bus one and bus two have an echo and a reverb on there. Let's go ahead and open this up and see what that is. Platinum verb, that's an old Logic reverb. I didn't set any of these parameters. For sure would not have like tweaked this, maybe. But I for sure didn't think about changing this like wet dry mix here. I would have just probably thrown the reverb on there. But let's go ahead and just turn all this off and see what it sounds like without it and just do a, a comparison and see if, you know, my use of reverb is improving it or making it worse. Uh, in my opinion, it's far better. <laughs> That's one thing that beginners do is they put way too much reverb on and they send everything to the same sort of sound. They send all frequencies, uh, all instruments to the same reverb. That's pretty common for beginners that are, are messing with reverb for the first time. Let's see a before and after. Notice the clarity that we get and the separation between these instruments. Yeah, we're losing space, but just listen to how much more, I would think, I would consider this to be much more impactful without the reverb, but we'll toggle it on and off. So here's with. And here's without. Ooh. 
with... Without... And I bet you if I was to just turn this down like halfway, we'd improve it. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go about like there. Yeah, so very basic, just turning down the amount that I'm actually sending signal to these two buses here, to my echo and to my reverb. I don't really have too many things going to the echo. Most of it's just going to the reverb. Uh, let's find out where my bass is though. I wanna demonstrate one more thing. Let's go ahead and just remove sort of the low end frequencies from the reverb. So I'm gonna turn both of these off. I guarantee that this is hogging up a ton of sonic real estate by sending this to, you know, the, the reverb, the, this bass line here. I'm pretty sure this is the bass. Yep. All right. So we'll leave the reverb on everything else. In fact, we could probably afford to turn this up just a hair on these other instruments. Let's go and do it about there. Guys, of course, there are so many other issues that we could solve, so many other problems. One of the more obvious ones is just a improper kind of volume balance. Well, I think there's three main things that beginners do. One is, you know, too much reverb. But the other thing is, I think the reason they do that is they're covering up and masking problems and issues in the mix. So that could be you know, the frequency issues. I'm hearing a lot of frequency issues in a lot of these sounds. Yet I've got this guitar amp on like distortion, guitar amp. This guitar amp is just sounds atrocious on all these instruments. And I'm sort of masking the, the frequency issues and smearing that with reverb. And yes, it's improving it, right? But we're taking something that sounds like a turd and just like making it a little bit better rather than solving those issues with frequencies and then putting that through through some reverb. Another thing is is like vocals. A lot of vocalists will just kind of smear maybe the imperfections in their vocal with a lot of reverb and it just becomes a, a washy mess. And then that low end though really makes a, a huge difference. Let's go ahead and turn this on and off and see how much of a difference this makes. Let's go ahead and turn this up to where it was. We'll go like this. I think it was about right there. And this was, a yeah, about right there. So I'm going to toggle this on and off and notice the difference that it'll make. Okay, it's just tighter overall. So uh, the third thing that I suppose beginners don't do is they just don't manage the frequency content that's going to the reverb. We'll get into that in more detail in just a moment, but let's go ahead and transition over to pro level reverb. Now there's a lot of ways in which professionals separate themselves from beginners with how they use reverb, but I'm gonna go ahead and focus on four main aspects. The first of these is reverb decay times and intentionally setting those reverb decay times to affect the front to back placement of different instruments in a mix. At mastering.com, we often talk about three different dimensions of space in a mix. That's the top to bottom, there's the left and right, and then there's the front to back. With front to back, you can use volume to bring something up closer with more volume, less volume, make it appear farther away. You can do the same with compression to uh, control, you know, the consistency of placing, you know, different instruments in that field. And one of the other ways that you can effectively create that front to back 
uh, separation between instruments is with reverb decay times. A shorter reverb decay time will appear closer in a mix than one with longer decay times. So you can really shove something further back in a mix by setting a longer decay time and vice versa. Another thing that pros not only do but understand is when and why they would place a reverb directly on a track or instrument versus sending their tracks to a reverb channel, a separate auxiliary channel that has the reverb on that channel. As you could see in Logic in that session, I had multiple instruments sending to one reverb. And the way that I like to sort of approach this is when thinking about creative decisions. If I want a spatial sound that is isolated to one particular instrument, or if I'm making a lot of automation moves where I'm, I'm doing some sound design with a reverb, then I'll isolate it to that one instrument track by placing the reverb directly on the track. Other than that, I pretty much will always put reverbs on an auxiliary track and send multiple instruments to those tracks. And this leads me to the third and fourth sort of aspects of what pros do with their reverb. And that's tone shaping and frequency management. So let's talk about tone shaping really quick. Tone shaping just refers to being able to really treat your reverb like an instrument, which it should be because just like any other tracks, you're creating space for those instruments to live in different parts of the frequency spectrum. As producers, you do this naturally by selecting instruments that slot into those very natural different parts of the frequency spectrum. And we would want to treat reverb much in the same way where we choose different reverbs, right? We could have a hall for all of our instruments and keys, or we could have, you know, plate where our vocals are sending to the plate. Those tonal differences between the, the plate and the hall reverbs are going to create some separation and, and allow those to sort of slot into different parts of the frequency spectrum. And the only way that you would be able to tone shape like this is by placing the reverb directly on an auxiliary channel. And then not only that, but you can manage the frequencies that are exciting the reverb by placing an EQ before the reverb. So the signal is sent to that channel and then it goes through that filter, that EQ filter, and then excites the reverb. And then you can further tone shape that with more EQ or some saturation, or you could put some delay after that, maybe ping pong delay to widen the reverb further. Another thing that pros will often do is place a compressor after the reverb on the aux channel and then set a sidechain input to where whenever the vocal comes in, it actually ducks the reverb down with that compression. And that's really useful for creating a huge vocal sound with a huge space without washing out the vocal completely because the vocal comes in and then it ducks the reverb down, leaving more space for that vocal to kind of sit on top of that reverb. Let's go ahead and just see some of these things in action. All right, let's take a listen to this track called Morning Glories by a band named Moodlight. That's M-O-O-D-L-I-T-E. Really fantastic artist. And this is actually a mix that was done, uh, the majority of the mix was done by our good buddy, Jake Codewise here at mastering.com. He did some really awesome work on this and then passed it off to me to do some final touches. Uh, a lot of which I'm going to be demonstrating will be just the work that he's done. So first let's start by playing the track and then we'll jump into these different aspects that we've kind of gone over. I can tell that you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about you. You know you've got to face it all on. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Just a reminder too, if you're using like smaller earbuds, uh, you're probably not going to notice a, a difference in some of the changes that we're going to demonstrate. So really good pair of headphones or like a good set of speakers. Full range speakers is going to be uh, the best listening environment uh, to really understand and listen to what we're demonstrating here especially with things like spatial processing. So first up, let's dive in and just check out what he's doing here with these reverbs on his vocal. And I actually played it with his EQ move off. And let's go ahead and just check this out. So we have a short Vox room, and then we have him sending as well to a longer Vox plate. So, Right off the bat there, the, there's some tonal differences between those two reverbs. A plate reverb is gonna be much more dense because it's like a sheet of metal. And so the decay times are, or sorry, the decay is really dense from start to finish all the way through. Um, and then a room, it just has a different characteristic. And so you're gonna get some separation there. But let's go ahead and actually demonstrate what happens when we increase decay time versus having a shorter decay time on that plate reverb. So let's go ahead and open this up. Here is with a shorter decay time. And what I want you to listen to is how it affects the front to back placement of this vocal. So here's short. So that you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about you. You know you've got to face it all on your own. But I can't feign it, I'm falling down. Don't you know that your expectations are old? I mean, that really brings it like right up front. As soon as I brought this from long to short, it really just put it up front for me. And that'll be more obvious if we turn up the reverb as well. So we'll do that one more time. Let's turn up like 4 dB or so. Here is short. So that you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about you. You know you've got to face it all on your own But I can't feign it, I'm falling down Don't you know that your expectations are old? Yep, definitely pushes that further back in the mix. Now let's go ahead and show you what he's doing with EQ here to manage the frequencies that are running into, in this case, he's actually got these uh, EQs after the reverb, but it'll pretty much have the same effect. So let's put this back to where it was, 1.69, I believe. And toggle this on and off. It's gonna be more obvious if I solo the vocal here. So let's do that and we'll toggle on and off these EQ moves and just observe how it changes the sound. So that you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about you. You know you've got to face it all on your own. But I can't feign it, I'm falling down. Don't you know that your expectations are old? So what he's doing here for tone shaping is most of the tone shaping is in this simple move of rolling off the high end. What this does is really allow a dampening effect on that reverb and gets that sibilance out of the way from the reverb so it's not adding on top of the sibilance that's already coming through uh, on the dry vocal. And so that's gonna just create a darker feel. It's gonna help that vocal to remain in that sort of placement of feeling just slightly a little bit more distant, but also help with manage 
those uh, sibilances and just those like high shimmery frequ frequencies that he didn't want in in that uh, vocal, in that reverb. Uh, let's see if you can tell a difference. Now what, what I want you to do is specifically focus in on the low end and how this low end roll off on the on both of these reverbs is changing and cleaning up uh, some of that like low mid information let's go ahead and toggle those on and off as we're playing so here's with tell that you're thinking about yourself you're thinking about yourself you're thinking about you you know you've got to face it all on your own but I can't feign it, I'm falling down Don't you know that your expectations are old? So what he's doing there is removing some of that fundamental kind of like woofy frequency that's coming in from the vocal from coming through on this reverb. And again even though it's coming after the reverb it's essentially having the same effect we're just removing unnecessary low mids that would otherwise uh, muddy up and clutter this mix a little bit more subtle in the inside the mix but let's uh, take a listen in the context of the entire track and we'll go ahead and unsolo that so that you're thinking about yourself you're thinking about yourself you're thinking about you you know you've got to face it all on your own But I can't feign it, I'm falling down Don't you know that your expectations are old? So pretty subtle when we talk, toggle it off and on, but it really does make a difference, especially as we move throughout the song and we introduce some more instrumentation, some more of those frequencies that'll be uh, coming from different instruments um, as this builds throughout. That's really how you, at a pro level, sort of place these elements of your mix in different places, right? Really what's happening as well is, is that EQ move of dampening uh, the high end of those reverbs is it's changing a little bit of that like top to bottom dimension of the mix. So we have the front to back with decay and then that top to bottom with EQ. The higher frequencies tend to feel up, up, up higher in placement and the lower, um, the opposite, the lower frequencies. Next, we're gonna jump right in and demonstrate what I think is expert level reverb. For me, anything expert level when it comes to mixing has to do with playing into the emotion of the track, playing to the emotions of the listener, and using the parameters, using automation uh, with reverb to create sort of movement and this like push and pull um, to really create interest, play to the subconscious of the listener and, and that emotion. And what he's doing here um, is he's kind of copied over some ends of phrases. So let's go ahead and solo this out and see what these little things are here. Okay, that's the end of uh, the word you. Okay, and then he's got, these ones are a little bit more obvious. So that's really, really low. Let me go ahead and bring that up in volume so you can hear those more. Yeah, so I'll undo that. And so this is really going to open up the ends of these words and phrases uh, because he's creating what you'd call like a reverb throw. And again, you can do this on the same track if you wanted to with like the mix knob like of the, the wet dry. Uh, this is just a, a little bit different and it actually I think works really, really well uh, to uh, again, to really like hit our emotions at the ends of these phrases. Let's go ahead and listen to that in context. You know you've got to face it all on your own. But I can't feign it, I'm falling down. Don't you 
Especially right here. Morning glories. So that right there, listen to that, how that blooms and opens up. My morning glories. Really beautiful moment there. So it's sort of... Uh, it's, it's sort of just like opening up the space, but it's very subtle in these other areas. And so I just think that is so cool because, you know, what's happening is in some cases we might get more of it as she sings louder and or we add more of the actual body of that word. Uh, whereas these ones are very much at the tail ends and are very, very subtle. But listen to when I toggle this off. I'm going to start from and play these two sections here. Listen to how that changes the, the ends of those words. Okay, here's with. Really kind of blooms and opens it up. And in the context of the mix, it is a little bit more subtle, but it's there. I love that. I think that is an expert level move, is using that as sort of a way to create that movement in that reverb. We're opening it up and letting it bloom by placing it on a different track here. Um, you can automate all kinds of things to create that sort of movement and just create variation from section to section in a song. In the verses, you could have not as much sending to the reverb and in the choruses you can have you know as much as like four five six db or more sending to that same reverb or just change the reverb altogether in uh in the chorus and have it open up a little bit more and that's gonna make things sound just like different cr create contrast uh variation and that's how we keep the listener engaged is really to hit their emotions with that movement. I think movement is huge when it comes to expert level reverb and really expert level anything when it comes to uh, mixing. All right, now it's time for you to step away from YouTube and actually get to work. It's simple, anytime that you learn something from a tutorial, you need to own that knowledge and make it personal by applying it ASAP in the real world. So what I've done is I've put together a nice little set of action items and a PDF doc that you can access through the link in the description below. So make sure you go and download that right now. Just enter your email and we'll send that right on over. And if you're in the position to do so, go through the steps that I have in there. I will take you through a beginner, a pro, and expert level exercises so that you can take your reverb skills to the next level. Also, don't forget that one of the best ways to train your ears on reverb is to listen to your favorite reference tracks and critically dial in your focus on how they use reverb on the vocal, the drums, the percussion, synths, keys, etc. I've got a great video for you on how exactly to set up references at a pro level that Rob Mazes has done, and that's linked also in the description below. So make sure to go ahead and check that out and we will see you all on the next video. That's all for now. Now you know, so let's go. Peace. <laughs>